Hello, hello, this is Brian from Tavarin Games again with another update on Little Vale. Now, I was pretty busy the last couple of weeks, so I didn't get quite as much done as I wanted to, but I was able to get a few things uh, added into the game. So the first thing I wanted to work on was improving my fishing minigame. Uh, originally, I had made it so that there was like four little test fish in the game, a minnow, a bass, a salmon, and oddly a tuna, um, and one type of fishing rod. Now, the tuna makes no sense, because this is like a mountain valley inland, all fresh water, so uh, I had got rid of that, and I wanted to look up a bunch of freshwater fish that would have been appropriate to uh, this area, uh, so like a nice mountain town. So I found this website called uh, Fishing Planet that has a whole bunch of information on fish you can find. So I looked up the Colorado fish, since that's sort of where the game is set, and uh, found a bunch of fish here, but there aren't that many. So I also looked up the fish from Michigan just to add a few fish from there. So the fishing isn't 100% accurate to what you would find in this setting, but it let me put a larger variety of fish into the game. So for each of this fish, you can see we've got uh, different weights listed and uh, values uh, for those weights, as well as pictures of the fish. Uh, so I compiled all that together into a spreadsheet uh, where I've got the name, um, the basic value of it, the weights, uh, pictures of the fish as well. Now the locations uh, on Fishing Planet I gave was just like what lakes you can find it in. Whereas I wanted to sort of have lakes, rivers, and ponds that. So I looked up the general locations you could find these fish in. Now most of them are found pretty much in all lakes and rivers or large rivers. So I kind of split it into... Uh, lake biome and a river biome slightly arbitrarily based on value with the fish that are only in rivers and lakes split accordingly. And then I assigned an in-game weight to the fish because the real weights like a 25 pound sturgeon your character would you know catch one and then not be able to walk because um, it's too heavy. So I made the weights a little more appropriate to what's in the game and then I made the values correspond so that as the fish sort of get larger and more rare and difficult to catch, I wanted it so that uh, the value per weight went up as well. So the sturgeon, if it was 25 pounds at, um, and this value, then it would be worth less per pound than a rock bass. So um, I increase, or I, with its reduced weight and the, keeping the value high, they all go up so that the rare fish are worth correspondingly more. So that these uh, rare fish are actually worth quite a lot in the game and it'll be quite lucrative. Uh, I'm just going to switch this down. Um, so here I decided was how I sort of figured out the rarity of the fish, like how to make them actually rare. So I put four different fishing rods. I want to put four different fishing rods in the game, each with a different quality. And the better quality fishing rods would be able to get, like, get rare fish on the line. So the rarity of the fish is in the same scale from like each fish is one higher up to, in this case, 10 um, for both the lake and river. However, I wanted to make it so that um, as the difficulty goes up, uh, the rarity increases as well, but as, and you have lower odds of catching it. And uh, it took a little while figuring out uh, how I could calculate this, and then I remembered exponential decay functions. So if the fishing rod quality is a decimal point, um, if we take that decimal point and put it to the power of the difficulty, we'll then get a smaller number for a higher difficulty. So I plotted that out, so you can see you have 1 to the power of 0.7, or 0 0.7 to the power of 1 is just 0.7, but uh, 0.7 to the power of 10 is 0 0.028. Then to sort of figure out the odds of actually catching the fish, we're going to be generating a random number in the game. So if we generate a random number from this lowest value up to 1, and then look at the odds of it being in the gap between these numbers, we can then calculate the percentage chance of each fish getting a line. So if we start with, say, a 0.7 as our rod quality, then we have minnows will get on the line quite often, and these larger catfish will very rarely get in line, only 1% of the time. If we make this lower, then we have a higher chance of getting these uh, lower quality, uh, more common fish, and a lower chance of getting the um, higher quality fish. And then if we get this all the way up to 0.99, all the fish have an equal chance of being caught. So this gave me a nice easy way, if we just change this number, um, depending on which rod you're using, we can then uh, easily change the fish you have a chance of catching. So the next part was to uh, actually code these into the game. So the first thing we're going to look at, the first thing I did is in the item references, uh, let's scroll down to the fishy fish. Here they are. So I code them all in. 
So they all have a name, a weight, the value I decided. Um, I haven't written descriptions for all of them yet. Uh, I will get to that at some point. Uh, so that's all them in as items. Uh, now though, we also need the icons that are going to be associated with each fish. Uh, so I had to make those. So in order to draw those up, we have, and uh, I basically took the picture from that fishing planet, uh, resized it, rotated it, shrunk it, and then um, sort of cartoonified a little bit and outlined it. Now these do look a little bit more realistic than what's in the game because I haven't gone over them too much. So I'll probably edit them just to make them look a little more cartoony. But for now, I think they look pretty good. Um, and each fish is easily identifiable and different. So we have these nice icons. Now this is in the game, they're all individual icons. I just put them together to show you here. So when it comes to the actual fishing, uh, implementing the rarity is done here when we actually start reeling the fish. So when you first start fishing, it doesn't know which fish is going to be on the line, which is realistic. Once uh, fish is has uh, bitten onto the hook and you start reeling it is when we determine which fish you've got on the line. So we just start with uh, the default rod quality of 0.7 I decided for the lowest quality rod, uh, which gets you um, most, basically you can get the first four fish on the list are reasonably common and anything above that is going to be pretty rare. And then it just checks if you have one of the better rods and if so it, imp it assigns the correct rod quality. Then we just grab um, the low, the base value, which is going to be sort of the highest difficulty from the fishing list of the location. So I added in these location lists. Now I've only added in uh, the river actually into the game. It's drawing from this list. However, once I actually put the lake in the game, I'm going to have it check where you're fishing and then pick which of these lists it's going to get its information from. And the list is just the, the fish are in the location and they're assigned difficulties. So that's where the difficulty stored is in this fishing script. So it gets sort of the highest difficulty fishes uh, difficulty, which is this one here. So we have the difficulty of the last value. And then it generates a random number from that value to the power, the rod quality to the power of that value uh, and one. Then it basically just assigns the first fish in the list to be the one that's going to be on the line. But then and then it goes through and determines, OK, let's go from the lowest difficulty fish, which is going to have the highest number, up to the highest difficulty fish. And for each one, just check, is the random number higher than that value? So if we go back and look at sort of the values we get, uh, let's make this the lower quality rod. And let's say the random number generates uh, 0.2. Well, it would look down and say 0.2. Oh, it's not higher than this. Go to the next one. Still not higher, still not higher. It keeps going through. And then it says, oh, but it is higher than this value. And it would assign this fish, in this case, the white sucker, to be the one that's caught. Um, oops, wrong button. But by first assigning the first fish here, no, no matter what, a uh, fish is going to end up on the line. And then it's going to send that to the fishing script and say, let's start fishing. So with the fishing script, and when you start fishing, um, it does, it assigns the fish difficulty, and then it assigns this swim time. Now the swim time variable is a float. And all what the functions or this script is doing is that every frame, it is checking, is the fish swimming? Or uh, it subtracts the current time difference from this swim time. And then if the fish was already swimming, it tells it to stop swimming um, and assigns a new value to this. And if it wasn't swimming, it tells it to start swimming. So we can use one float to uh, control everything. So when we first put a fish on the line, it determines the, uh, the amount of time before the fish starts swimming uh, that first time. So we're dividing the fish difficulty um, from this float I chose, and I played around with these numbers till it seemed right, and then adding on a random amount on top of that uh, that's basically the same number. And since we're dividing by the fish difficulty, higher difficulty fish are going to start swimming sooner than lower difficulty fish. Uh, and that's how we want it. Like, um, and then I have this a little print command just tell me which fish it is for me to cheat. And then we assign the line strength and the real speed to each fishing rod, with line strength being how long the line can last um, to the fish pulling against it, and the real speed being how far you can pull, or how far the fish is going to get pulled every time you press space while you're fishing. And the nice thing of having um, these as variables here we can send to the rod is we could, I could then introduce items like high strength fishing line or different uh, reels that you could use to upgrade your current fishing rod before you go up to the next level fishing rod. So I could have a quite a bit of nuance in this uh, fishing mini game. And then it also randomizes the fish's starting position. Um, so it starts in the center, and then it adds an amount uh, on that.
based on the difficulty of the fish. So more difficult fish will show up a bit further down. And we're using these random, this random value again to add variety uh, to each fish. So not every encounter with the fish is the exact same. And then once you start reeling the fish, once it's actually going, so that's using this variable, uh, we're then checking if the fish is swimming or not. If it is swimming, it's going to move away from you uh, a speed of one per tick, or a unit of one per tick, uh, plus the one-tenth of the difficulty. So the catfish will swim at about twice the speed of a minnow, which is quite a big difference in this little mini game. I played around with this value, and you don't going above uh, two here at maximum, the fish are blasting across the screen and are gone. Uh, then we we rotate the fish uh, just to make it just to animate it a little bit, and then we're subtracting some time. So when it finishes swimming, when this is, gets to zero, it then uh, signs another a randomized idle time. And again, we're dividing out the difficulty of the fish, so more difficult fish will uh, will be idle for a shorter amount of time than less difficult fish, and they'll start swimming again sooner, which makes them more difficult to catch. And then if the fish isn't actively swimming, we don't move it at all and uh, we just uh, subtract the swim time, and when it gets below zero, we then figure out how long this fish is now going to swim for. Again, uh, this time taking the difficulty, dividing it by an integer, and then adding a random amount on top. And this means, uh, because we start with the difficulty on top here and divide by a number, the more difficult fish will swim for longer. So they'll swim for longer and they'll idle for less time, and that makes them more difficult to catch. And I played around with these uh, numbers we're doing the divisions by uh, quite a bit until I found that the difficulty felt right for each fishing rod. Uh, but this will probably change sort of a, ideally as more people play the game and as I test it out and add more fish and sort of fine tune it. But that's roughly how the fishing strip works. Now the other thing it's checking is are you pr did you press the space bar? Uh, so basically are you trying to reel in the fish? Now if the fish is actively swimming, it just takes the difficulty of that fish uh, and subtracts it from the line strength, and starts so it starts to weaken the lot, your fishing line, um, but only if the fish is swimming while you're reeling it. And then it pulls the fish by the reel speed. Now, with the high quality rods that have a higher line strength and the um, less difficult fish, it's subtracting so little here that you can actually just sort of ramp, like just constantly reel and you won't have to worry about the line breaking. But the more difficult fish will certainly stress the line and uh, likely break it. So again, that's one way um, the more difficult fish are more difficult to catch versus the uh, less difficult fish, the minnows, versus which are super easy and you can pretty much just catch them. Uh, and then, we're re uh, then I take this bit of code and recolor the line based on the current line strength. So the lower the line strength, uh, the more red it becomes. So as the line becomes more stressed, it goes from white to red. And if that gets the line strength goes to zero, uh, the, you get a message of line broken, it ends the fishing with you failing to catch the fish. Um, the other possibility of failing to catch the fish is the fish gets to the end of the fishing UI and escapes, in which case you get a fish got away message, and again it fails to catch. However, if the line position successfully gets to the front end of the UI, to the fishing rod, and the, fishing, the line strength's not zero, uh, you end up catching the fish, and then that just goes through the player controller script to add it to your inventory. So in practice, um, so I've made, uh, I've got a game here where I've got all the different fishing rods. So we can go fishing. So right now we don't know what fish it's going to be, uh, but the bobber is going to start bobbing. If we catch that, we get a fish on the line, in this case a minnow. So we can press space to pull it in. And uh, you can see with the minnow once in a while, it'll start swimming. Now the minnows don't swim very often. They're meant to be super easy catch. In fact, this one just is refusing to swim away. Uh, it's a long time. So. I wanted the minnows to be super easy to catch. We'll just try another one with this rod and see what we get on the line. Another minnow. Will it start swimming? I don't know. But you can see, there it goes. It swam for a little bit. But the minnows really put up no fight. Now, we can see we got those in the inventory now. Now, if I go to a better fishing rod, we will hopefully catch something a little rarer right now, since they're all equal odds with this fishing rod. And just wait for that. So, oh, this is catfish. So you can see it swims a lot more, and it swims much faster. And you can hear my space bar. Oh, you can see the line gets really stressed really fast. Oh, and we ended up breaking the line. So you can see the catfish are quite difficult to catch, and they're meant to be. Um, but it is still somewhat randomized, so some of the catfish will be easier, some more difficult. But yeah, so that's the update to the fishing script. So let's pause this. 
So the other thing I got done, um, I did fix a few little bugs, but I won't talk about those. Uh, I wanted to get a couple more crops in the game and sort of make those look a bit nicer. So I added in this beetroot crop, and so this is the little sprite sheet for it, starting with its seeds and then its four growth stages up until it is done growing and you can pick the crop. And then same thing, I added in wheat. Now you can see this wheat sprite sheet is uh, taller than the beetroot. So what I found, I already had corn in the game um, on a similar size 32 pixel tall sprite sheet to this beetroot, but it looked really weird because it looks super short compared to these really, these crops that should be much smaller than it. So I doubled the height of the sprite sheet and then extended the corn sprite up into that vertical space. So this way it still ends up nicely centered on the tile in the game without me having to fiddle about with its positioning and its... Um, because it's going to sort from the center point, but then it lets me draw it a little bit taller into the space. And I made the wheat a tall crop as well. Um, so for the beet roots and wheat, I added in the icon, so the base beet roots, uh, seeds for it you can use to plant it, and the cooked beet root. Uh, I'll get into cooking in a second. And then wheat, which uh, doesn't have a cookable form yet. So those are now in the game. Another fun uh, little addition I did for that, uh, if we go back in and we load up uh, a game where I've got some this one uh, some crops here it'll just take a second to load come on usually it's quicker loading than this all right there we go um, so you can see I, I already have some crops here at different growth stages I cheat this is day one I cheated to get them fully grown I just did it in the UI here uh, if we walk past these crops I'd give them a little sway as you walk past the taller crops the ones that extend over the tile just because it looks nice and I think it's just a little quality of life improvement um, and we can pick the crop, so we just have a little wheat here. And now if we go to the corn, we can pick the corn. Now the corn is a crop that will regrow the corn on the stalk. Um, I know that's not super realistic, but uh, I want some crops to be regrowable, like you find in Harvest Moon and Stardew Valley, and some of them, uh, when you grab them, are just pulled up. But yeah, so that's a nice little quality of life improvement. Uh, Code-wise, if you want to see how that's done, uh, it's in the crop script. So for the taller crops I define here, so in this case wheat and corn, I can change this at any time. So if I want to make the shorter crops uh, rotate, I can uh, just get rid of this line of code and make them all rotate. And as I add taller crops, I can sort of add it to this list. So it uh, will check for the crops I want it to only. So only the ones we define will actually have this uh, swaying motion. So what it uh, does is it draws a little uh, ray tracing line above the crop in sort of this tile above it. Um, it's box colliders down here, actually on the square. But above it, it checks, draws a ray tracing line and sees, has anything entered that space um, here, like uh, that's just entered. So it, it sees if there's a hit and if that space was already occupied. And if there was nothing there before and something's enter it, it sets this value, this uh, sway value to 1.5. Uh, so which is going to be 1.5 seconds and tells it, okay, now sway for that amount of time. So here it checks, is the sway greater than zero? And then it does a rotation. Um, it moves the crop, uh, rotates it, based on the sway value, or sorry, a set amount. And then when it gets to that sway value, it then starts rotating the other direction. Um, and this sway value is constantly being decreased. So as it sways, the amplitude gets less and less. And then at, uh, 0.5, I just reset the sway to zero because I found it looked a little silly. Like when it would get to the end, it would be vibrating extremely quickly. This just makes sure it only sways a couple times and then stops. Uh, and then if you leave that space and re-enter it or something else re-enter it or another animal, it will then rerun this little sway script for each of them. So that's how that's running. So it's just a little ray trace. And it looks, looks pretty good in my opinion. Now, with all these new fish and new crops, I added in a bunch of new recipes, which... Firstly, means uh, making icons for recipes. So here's all the cooked fish icons. Now, again, I just took existing images and resized them, outlined them, uh, so they don't look like in the styles game or cartoony. I'm gonna have to redo these at some point. I just wanted to get icons in so it was clear which one was which. Um, and same thing, I already showed you the cooked beetroot icon. The wheat uh, can't be cooked as is. Um, I'm going to make, add in a feature at some point where you can mill the wheat into flour and then use that in the cooking recipes. So if we go to my cooking scripts, uh, we can look at, oh, it's right there. Uh, we can look at sort of how cooking works in this game. 
Uh, I also had to fix a nice big bug in the cooking script where it was incorrectly identifying recipes. Uh, did that this morning. But yeah, so in this script, we have all the different items that can be cooked. Um, so as I add food items to the game, I'll add them into this of uh, the possible ingredients. So in this case, we have the different vegetables we can cook. Uh, there are eggs in the game um, and then the different fish and their cooked versions. And then I've got the recipes. So the recipe is an item that has an icon, which so I've shown you a few of those. Um, and then it has, uh, sorry, the item that it produces ID from the item script. So if we look over here and say, look at these cooked items, see there's an ID. So a cooked potato, well, that ID is what this recipe is looking to produce. And then we have uh, the name of the recipe, which would be displayed to the player. So this can be different from this. And then up to three ingredients. Um, all the recipes are going to be one, two, or three ingredients. And then finally, the quantity of items that that recipe makes, which lets it um, me make the same item with, like, say, higher quality ingredients might produce more of a recipe. So you can uh, get an advantage for having higher quality ingredients. Now, for the fish, you can see we have fewer cooked versions. That's because um, there's multiple different types of trout and bass in the game, but each of them is going to produce the same, uh, the same type of fish, the cooked fish in the end, but just different amounts of it based on the size of that bass. So like a little rock bass is going to make uh, two of that, whereas if you go down into the smallmouth bass, you're going to end up with uh, four of them because smallmouth bass tend to be bigger. And same thing with the trout. Uh, the brown trouts tend to be bigger than the rainbow trouts. Uh, so they're going to make four versus uh, two. As, or, yep, yeah, four versus two as well. So that's one way we can sort of control that. So I added in all the fish recipes. And as you saw, I added in the beetroot recipe to the cooked vegetables. And then we have these sort of mixed ones where we're looking for these generic items. Um, which might just be any type of fit, any type of cooked fish in this case, and any type of vegetable. And so I've got these generic lists of the generic vegetables and generic fish. So this way, if you mix um, a piece of perch with a potato, it makes just fish and veggies. Um, if you mi mix trout with carrots, again, it'll just make fish and veggies. This way, I don't have to have you know thousands of different recipe results, which would take forever to code and make tons of icons and make the game huge. Instead, it's uh, simplified down quite a bit by using gen these generic lists. And then what it's doing, um, it's actually going to check your recipes. Um, so we'll look at the recipe check. It's going to go through the recipe list. And just so let, if you only have a one ingredient um, in the cooking, it's going to look at the one ingredient recipes only. And then it's going to identify, OK, is the item you does the item you put in match um, a recipe. If not, go to the next recipe and go through the recipes till you find a matching recipe. And if it does match, okay, we're going to add that to the known recipes list and we're actually going to cook it. Um, and the cooking is down here. Whereas if it fails to find a recipe, it'll just make trash. So any combination that I haven't coded into one of the recipes is going to be considered inedible. Uh, and then, so for two and three ingredients, it's doing a similar thing. Uh, and this is where I had to fix the bug, because what it was doing is it earlier, it was identifying um, if an ingredient matched any, uh, like an ingredient you put in matched uh, one of the recipe items, it would then go to the next one, and then it could match the same ingredient to multiple required items. So if you had like an egg and a potato in there, it would just see that as multiple potatoes and cook a potato salad. Um, instead of making trash, which it should for that, because that's not eggs and potatoes don't make a recipe yet. Uh, so instead what it does is identifies which of the ingredient, so it goes through first the first item you've placed in and determines in the recipe which of those ingredients it matches. And then based on which one, if it matched one of them based on that, it will then check the other ingredient and see if that matches. And if it does, it will then cook the correct recipe. So in action, that is now working nicely. Let's unpause. We can go here. Uh, we'll grab a little more food from the fridge. So I put some starting food in this fridge. I should swap the salmon out for a lower quality fish now because I made salmon worth more in my fishing update. But it's salmon for now. So if, say, we put a salmon in there and try to cook it, at first we don't know the recipe because we've never cooked it before. So if we cook that, we now have a recipe of cooked salmon. It'll make five. We can pop corn in there. Doesn't know. Never cooked it before. Oh, we make cooked corn. Now, if we put the salmon back, it knows the recipe. So that's cooked salmon. 
If we say add a potato for two ingredient, well, uncooked salmon plus potato just makes trash. However, if we take a cooked salmon and a potato, we get fish and veggies, and so on and so forth. So the cooking um, is working pretty well. Again, once you've identified recipes, those save, and it will remember those recipes for you. So if you put those ingredients in again, um, it will let you know. So we know that, but um, we go down and save these two. Oh, yeah, it didn't save that one because it just makes trash. But for the recipes you do know, it will actually show that. And in the future, I can make it so that maybe you learn a recipe from an, one of the non-player characters or somebody else, and it will add it to your known recipes list before you've cooked it. So that way uh, you can have sort of some recipes already populated. But yeah, so that is the update for this few weeks. If you made it this far, thank you for watching. Uh, if you'd like to support me, you can do so over on my Patreon. Otherwise, have a great day.